afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Today we mark the 136th birth anniversary of Professor Devendra Mohan Bose, a gifted physicist of international acclaim, who was also the second director of Bose Institute. In the past, we celebrated this important annual event by gathering together and hosting distinguished scientists who delivered the D.M. Bose Memorial Lecture. Regrettably, this year, we have been forced to alter this time-honored tradition because of the unprecedented situation arising out of the raging global pandemic. Although we have to forego the pleasure of the company of our well-wishers, on this important occasion, we have made every effort to ensure that the DM Bose Memorial Lecture is held on this day. Thus, for the first time, we meet together in the virtual mode so that the safety and security of none is compromised. We hope you will understand these constraints and bear with us this year. We are very honored to have with us today as our speaker, the distinguished mathematician, Professor Mohan Moharaj from the School of Mathematics, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. He is renowned for his research contributions in the field of geometry, particularly in the areas of ending lamination spaces and hyperbolic manifolds. Sir, all of us at Bose Institute sincerely thank you for accepting our invitation. We will begin today's events with a welcome address by Professor Udal Bondabhattai, the director of Bose Institute. Sir. Good afternoon, respected Professor Mohan Maharaj, Dr. Sumit Song, Director of AECC, colleagues, staffs, students, ex-employees of Bose Institute, and innumerable admirers of Professor Devendra Mohan Bose. We have assembled virtually to observe 136th birthday of Professor D.M. Bose by organizing D.M. Bose Memorial Lecture. The speaker is a very well-known and accomplished mathematician, Professor Mohan Maharaj from TIFR. The title of the talk is Hyperbolic Geometry and Chaos in the Complex Plane. Certainly, you will all enjoy his brilliant piece of presentation. In this auspicious occasion, it's my privilege to offer some facts of Professor D.M. Bose to you. Professor Bose an exceptional Indian physicist who made extraordinary contributions in the field of cosmic rays, artificial radioactivity, and neutron physics. Bose completed his higher studies from Christ's College, Cambridge, and worked at the Cavendish Laboratory under Sir J.J. Thompson and had practical training under C.T.R. Wilson. After completing his graduation in physics abroad, he returned to India and worked as a lecturer in City College, Calcutta. He was appointed as a ghost professor in the University College of Science, Calcutta in 1914. He received his doctorate degree from Humboldt University, Berlin in 1919. His work abroad on magnetism and discovery of artificial transmutation using cloud chamber as well as his work on cosmic rays in India with Viva Chaudhary in discovering new mason using half tone yield float plates in the high altitude regions of Darjeeling are legendary. Along with Viva Choudhury, he had observed long curved ionizing tracks that were different from the tracks of alpha particle or protons. He calculated the mass of the particles from their trajectories and concluded that these were meson, new meson. Despite the pioneering work of Bose and Choudhury, the 1950 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to C. F. Powell for developing photographic method of studying nuclear processes and discovery of meson with no mention of Bose and Choudhury. Powell, however, acknowledged the pioneering contribution of Bose and Choudhury, stating Bose's work was the first to show that one can distinguish between the tracks of protons and mesons in an emulsion, and that it is possible to derive the mass of these tracks. 
after assuming the charge of director of Shiva Bose Institute in 1938, he engaged himself in tuning the institute into a leading national center for investigations in sciences. DM Bose reorganized the existing research groups into investigations in agriculture, industry, medicine. It was DM Bose who pioneered research in microbiology at Bose Institute and ventured the product production of new antibiotics. The new departments introduced were physics, biophysics, chemistry, including plant chemistry and biochemistry, botany, including plant physiology, cytogenetics, plant breeding and microbiology, including soil microbiology and genetics of microorganisms. An atomic research committee was formed by CSIR in which DM Bose and Bose Institute, along with other selected institutes, were invited to participate in shaping the nuclear energy program of India. The beginning of studies of history of science in India was also originated after the National Symposium on the History of Science of India at Bose Institute in 1961 under the leadership of DM Bose. In this way, DM Bose made a significant contribution in setting Bose Institute into a modern laboratory of international standard. DM Bose was intimately associated with Vishwabharati and was close with Rabindranath Tagore. He was the member of the Vishwabharati Sangsad since 1929. During the centenary celebration of Tagore's birthday in 1961, Vishwabharati awarded Deshikattam its highest award to DM Bose. DM Bose served as the director of Bose Institute till 1967, when his health problems forced him to take retirement. In the later years of his life, he became more interested in philosophy, focusing on the relationship between religion and science. In 1969, he was offered or conferred DSC by the University of Calcutta and Jalup University. His last great work was as the editor of the book, A Concise History of Science of India. He passed away on June 2nd, 1975. Please pay attention to the next program and enjoy the lecture. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Today's function will be presided over by Dr. Shubit Cho, outstanding scientist in the Department of Atomic Energy and the director of the Variable Energy Cyclotron Center, Kolkata. Dr. Shaw graduated in 1987 from the prestigious Bengal Engineering College, Chitpu, with a degree in Electronics and Telecommunication Engineering. After successfully completing the Bhava Atomic Research Center Training School, he joined BECC as a scientific officer. Subsequently, he obtained a PhD in Engineering Sciences from Homi Bhava National Institute, Mumbai. At BECC, he has played key roles in several high-profile international collaborative projects. He served as an invited foreign researcher at High Energy Accelerator Organization, KEK Japan. He has also worked with RF system of K800 superconducting cyclotron at Laboratorio del Sud, INFN, Catania, Italy. He has served as sub-project coordinator from PECC for Indian Institutions Fermilab collaboration on superconducting RF cavity for high energy proton linear accelerator. As project director, Medical Cyclotron Project PECC, he led the team to carry out installation and commissioning work of 30 mega electron volt medical cyclotron system and thereafter, continuing production and delivery of radioisotope and radio pharmaceuticals to the hospitals on a regular basis. Several awards of BAE, such as Science and Technology Excellence Award 2008, Group Achievement Awards in 2009, 12, 14, 16, and 18, have been conferred upon Dr. Shom in recognition of his important contributions to the ongoing programs of the year. Thank you, sir, for accepting this invitation and taking time out of your busy schedule to be here with us today to chair today's lecture.
I now request you to kindly preside over today's lecture and introduce the speaker. So, thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Udoy Bandopadhyay, Director Bose Institute, Kolkata. Professor Mohan Maharaj, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It's a great honor for me to chair this prestigious program of DM Bose Memorial Lecture to be held on the great occasion of 136th part celebration of Professor Devendra Mohan Bose. As you all know, and Professor Bandopad has already detailed about Professor Bose's work. So now let me take the opportunity to introduce an eminent Indian mathematician. He graduated with a master's in mathematics from IIT Kanpur in 1992. Doctorate. Received the Earl C. Anthony Fellowship, University of California, Berkeley, in 1992 to 93, and also received for 1996 97. He worked briefly at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai, in 98. Also worked as professor of mathematics and dean of research at the Ramakrishna Mission Vivekananda University till 2015. Currently, he is a professor of mathematics at the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, EIFR, Mumbai. He is a recipient of the 2011 Shanti Swarup Bhatnagar Award and the Infosys Prize 2015 for mathematical sciences. He is best known for his work in hyperbolic geometry, geometric group theory, low dimensional topology and complex geometry. He has widely published and presented his research in the area of hyperbolic manifolds and ending lamination spaces. His most notable work is the proof of existence of canon Thurston maps. This led to the resolution of the conjecture that connected limit sets of finitely generated Kleinian groups are locally connected. He is also the author of a book titled Maps on Boundaries of Hyperbolic Metric Spaces. He was an invited speaker at the International Congress of Mathematicians in the year 2018 in Rio de Janeiro. With this brief introduction, I would invite Professor Mohan Maharaj to deliver the TM Bose Memorial Lecture on hyperbolic geometry and chaos in the complex plane. So thank you all. And finally, special thanks to Professor Bandopadhyay, Udaya Bandopadhyay, Director Bose Institute, for giving me this opportunity. So Professor Maharaj. So uh, the screen is visible now. I mean, because I can see only my screen now. Is it visible? Yes. OK, thank you. We, thank you. we can see you, but uh, maybe uh, we don't see your screen yet. Oh. We can see yes. you, but uh, are you sharing your screen? Yes, I'm sharing my screen. Uh, maybe, no, I'm just seeing. Maybe you can uh, unshare it and then share it once again, please. Yeah, share your screen once more, maybe. Thank <laughs> you. 
Yeah, I've started sharing. Is it visible? Yeah, uh, looks like it's coming. I'll just confirm. All right. Yes. Is it visible now? Is it visible now? We are checking. We are checking. Not yet. But not yet. Not yet. Give us a. Oh. Uh, no, it's. it's uh, ah, now is it better? Not yet, but can maybe log up and then log in because he's here. I am able to see that's that. Dr. Shom, can you see it? Yes, yes. Oh, is it? Okay. The, the, the slides are visible? Yeah, from my place it is visible. But from both Okay, so there's there's a problem at our end. Yeah, don't worry, then go ahead go ahead. Okay. Um All right. Um, Just give us a couple of minutes. We'll, we'll... Yeah. I mean, uh, it's, it's the slide called uh, hyperbolic geometry and chaos in the complex plane. Is, is that... I know, but we, we are just seeing you. So we are I just see. getting a technical person to help us out. Yeah. Right. Kindly bear with us for two minutes. Sure, sure. sure. No, uh, for Professor Shom, uh, the, the yeah, slide... yeah, I, I can see. Yeah, I can see properly. Yeah. OK, very good. Professor Maharaj, can yeah. you just log out once and log back in? Sorry, but there okay. uh, seems to be something of a technical glitch. All right. Yeah. Is this better? Yes, we, we can see you now. We can see your screen. Yeah, you can see my screen and the slide slide on it. Yes. Yes. OK, excellent. Yeah, so now it should be in full screen mode. Right. So shall we, shall we start? Yes, please. Yes. OK. Invitation to speak here um, for the uh, for the lecture. It's a rare honor, and I'm not sure if I'm really the right person. Uh, and uh, thank you, Professor Shom, for the very kind introduction, and Professor Uda Gondapadhe for kind invitation. Um, so the uh, topic that we want to talk about today is hyperbolic geometry and chaos in the complex plane. Um, this is supposed to be addressed to basically people in the natural sciences. So, um, but before we get there, 
I just want to have one slide on the person uh, whose mathematics this work is really based on. So this is a picture of Bill Thurston, who is uh, somebody who brought three-dimensional hyperbolic geometry into mainstream mathematics in the 70s. And since then, it has... Uh, has I think your uh, full screen is not coming. Uh, maybe you should uh, uh, share your... Are not moving. Maybe the slides are not moving. Yes. Yeah, no, yeah. No. Can you do full screen, maybe? Yeah, I, I was on full screen so far. Okay. Can uh, you quit your full screen and do it once more? Yeah. Let's see. Yeah. How about now? Now it's how much of the screen is being occupied? I mean, for me, the full screen is being occupied by the slides. I see. It's okay. Uh, it, please go ahead. Uh, alternately, I can try to let's see. Uh, let's see if I stop presenting and then start again. Uh, I'm a little worried that it might just go off again. That's right. Uh, Professor Maharaj, it's it's fine. Well, we can see the slides, so please go ahead with your full screen. All right. OK. okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, so this is the full screen. Yeah, so the, the mathematician on whose work all of this is going to be based is this mathematician called Bill Thurston. And uh, I've just given a quote from his from a talk that he gave at which I was luckily pre present. This was in early 2011 or thereabouts, 2010 maybe, uh, in, in Paris. And uh, he mentioned this, that the best mathematics uses the whole mind, embraces human sensibility, and is not at all limited to the small portion of our brains that calculates and manipulates symbols. Through pursuing beauty, we find truth. And where we find truth, we discover incredible beauty. So this was in 2010 or 2000, yeah, around that time, 2009, 2010. And shortly afterwards, uh, the man was afflicted with uh, with melanoma, a fairly fatal form and rare fatal form of skin cancer. And uh, after he recovered, this was in 2012. In July 2012, there was again a conference in uh, Utah, Park City where he gave a talk and uh, it was not possible for enunciate his words very clearly basically because his mouth was filled with ulcers but in spite of that he gave a talk and his son who is also a well-known mathematician just transcribed what he said on the board and this was some basic fundamental advance that he had done after coming out of cancer i mean we we were at the same table, so I was able to see him. And uh, he was extremely emaciated. As you can see in this particular picture, he's quite a well-built, strong person. But after his cancer, he was quite uh, frail and uh, was quite disoriented. He was finding it difficult to walk. But when it came to mathematics, he gave a lecture as if nothing had happened. And just about a month afterwards, he passed away fairly peacefully in his sleep. So the reason why I mention this is because the, the doing of science and mathematics is something that is supposed to really involve us at a pretty fundamental level of our personality, our being. And uh, in Bill, this was uh, quite, quite visible. I mean, just a month before passing away, I mean, what, a, what better swan song can one have? but to be able to do mathematics right till the very end, so to speak. All right. So that's that's one of the reasons why I have put this. I mean, and the other thing is, of course, the content of what he is saying here, namely that it's the doing of science or mathematics is, is not about some formal pursuit, but it's, it's a pursuit of something pretty fundamental to what defines us as human beings. Here, he picks up truth and beauty. And essentially, the scientific pursuit is really at its core 
a pursuit of truth above everything else. And that is intimately tied to what we, at least in mathematics, because mathematics straddles two things. I mean, the, uh, it used to be and regarded as part of the arts at some point of time. And it's also the language of reason, the language of science. And therefore, the, the notion of beauty, which typically uh, is, is the guiding motive for the arts, also gets tied in, in, a, in a pretty inseparable way. And uh, maybe the best way to summarize the, the particular position that mathematics occupies is, is a quote of the statement of Sylvester, Sylvester's laws of in, law of inertia, people who have heard that, um, who described in, in French, he says, uh, Les mathématiques, uh, musique de la raison. So mathematics is the music of reason. So it's, it's the music being the the art component and reason being the science component and uh, a synthesis of the two is what gives rise to mathematics. Okay, so now uh, we come to the theme of our talk per se, namely hyperbolic geometry. And since this is a natural science uh, um, audience with an uncontroversial example of nature, namely a tree. And uh, the best way to say what hyperbolic geometry is is to say it's that is to say that it is the geometry underlying that underlying the underlying a tree underlying the structure of a tree. What does that uh, there is from the mathematical point of view the foliage or That's the leaf. Yes. Maharaj, I'm sorry to interrupt you again, but did you change your slide? Slide. Oh, yeah, I have changed my slide. Oh, okay. May I ask you to try PowerPoint instead, which we, you were doing initially? Probably there's something wrong with uh, PDF that, that that's not changing. I, I, I really apologize for interrupting this, you so much. Now it's changed. All right. Yes. All right. All right. So, I think, so, so no, I've been using PDF all along. It's just that uh, I was going into this full screen mode, and then I think clicking is causing. Uh, so this is this is all right. This is let's see. Yes, yes, we see the tree clearly. This now. is changing now. Is it changing? Yes, now? absolutely. All right, okay, fine. Okay. fair enough. Fair enough. So um, yeah, so the the best way to describe hyperbolic geometry is to say that it's the geometry underlying that for tree. But what do we mean? So in order to understand what is the geometry underlying the tree, not its. Uh, biological functioning, we strip away the inessential structure from a mathematical point of view. And was something that was probably essential from the tree's point of view, namely the foliage, the leaves, have been removed. And now we have left. We are left with the bare skeleton of the tree, which captures its geometry perhaps the best. Uh, this new screen is also the new slides are visible now? Yes, yes, we can, yes we can see it. So it is changing, right? Okay, fine. All right, but even this is sort of too much information to systematize. There's an artist's rendering of what a tree would look like on the two-dimensional plane. And I'll just draw your um, attention to one thing, namely that at E, happening is that there are three branches, one coming in, two going out, and this goes all the way. And so what has happened is that towards the end, there's uh, I mean, the, the, the number of the branches are becoming smaller and smaller, and they seem to be converging to some kind of an artistic pattern. But uh, yeah, so what we want to do is simplify this still further and straighten it out. And here is another picture of the same tree, but simplified as much as we can. So there's this main trunk um, going from, from this base point up to the point where it bifurcates into these two limbs. Is is my uh, mouse uh, cursor? Is it is it visible as I move move yes, it on yes, the Yes. Okay. Very good. All right. So you have the main trunk going straight up, and then there are these two branches. Each of these branches now bifurcates into two further branches. Each branch into two further branches, and so on ad infinitum. Yeah. All right. So one thing that I'll draw your attention to here is that as you go up, uh, what happens is that the 
length of the branches starts decreasing and they become more and more slender. I mean, in a physical tree, as you as as, um, as it starts going further and further towards the end, the branches become smaller till they become twigs, and then the then leaf, which is sort of the tip of uh, of a, which is there at the tip of branches. Inside that, there are these uh, tendrils, the, 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 the main, um, yeah, so, so it, the, there is this geometric pattern that replicates itself even inside a leaf. Yeah. So with the, this bifurcation still goes on even inside a leaf. Um, if, you, if you look at a leaf under a, a magnifying glass, the, the, the same kind of branching structure is replicated there. What's what's going on here? I mean, as far as the geometry is concerned, what is really going on here is something that we shall try to now explore. Uh, first, so these are mathematical questions, and we'll there are physical answers, physics answers to the same question, but we'll give more mathematical answers to this. That the tree, in order to branch out necessarily has to shrink the size of its branches as it goes further and further out towards the, the boundary foliage is not an accident. It's something that is forced by the geometry of the Euclidean space on the tree. So for the time being, I just mentioned some words and we'll try to explore the meaning of these words as we go further on. What's happening is that, as I have said, before that the underlying geometry of the tree is what is called hyperbolic. We'll say more in more precise terms what that means a little later. But uh, it's it's yeah, I mean it's it's really the picture of the tree that you see in front of you. That's that's really the underlying geometry. What does it mean to be the intrinsic geometry of a tree? Imagine a creature that lives on the tree itself. So there is no space outside the tree that the creature lives on. And then all the journeys that the creature makes, say, for example, a squirrel or an ant, I mean, that would be entirely, his entire universe is really the tree. But the, this tree universe is surrounded by Euclidean space. That, the, the Euclidean geometry or the flat space geometry of Euclidean space and the hyperbolic geometry of the tree, these are not compatible with each other. If they were compatible, what would happen is that a tree would be able to multiply its branches and new branches would have the same length as the, the stem of the tree, as the, as the initial large piece. So if you try to draw this kind of large stem at, at each, each bifurcation, so each of these branches, if they were as long as the original one and the subsequent ones were also as long as the original one, then pretty soon you'll realize that you will not, you will start uh, crowding the Euclidean plane, the, the, the piece of paper on which you're drawing this, it will get very crowded. And this is not an accident. There is actually a theorem which says basically that you cannot embed a tree where all the branches and the stem are of the same size in Euclidean plane. So you are, you're forced to shrink just for purely mathematical reasons, not for, there are no physical reasons are necessary for this. Uh, you cannot fit a tree with all kinds of branches, or all branches of the same size inside Euclidean plane. This is a, a theorem of um, another mathematical David Hilbert uh, around the turn of the 20th century, so around 1900 or so is when, when he proved this theorem. So basically, uh, what he was making Pinning down was the, that the, the geometry of the tree and the geometry of the space we live in, the Euclidean geometry of the space we live in, these are different. And I'll again draw your attention to the fact that the, this is reflected in the, in the phenomenon which we are all familiar with, namely that branches are shorter than the stem. And the further you go away from the ground, the branches become smaller and smaller. Yeah, so the, this particular explanation has nothing to do with the strength of the the I mean the, the stem is has to be strong to support the whole whole uh, um, weight of the tree. So even if trees grew horizontally, they would be doing the same thing. They would be bifurcating 
uh, in this particular way and branches at further and further distance away from the root would become smaller and smaller. So there is a certain natural physical problem that the tree is trying to solve. And uh, let me let me come to a simpler picture of the tree, a still more simplified picture of the tree, the way mathematicians think of it. And then we'll come back to the physical problem that the tree is trying to solve in doing this branching. So this is what mathematicians call a tree. It's a graph where there are no loops and all edges are of length one. Yeah. So that's all. So it's a graph without loops. And so it's got, got a collection of vertices, got a collection of edges, and it's connected. And there are no loops. So basically, you I mean, if you want to go from any point here to any point here, there is no shortcut. You have to go all the way back to the stem of the tree and then go back up again. Yeah. So that's that's the point. That's that's what this is the structure underlying a tree. Now, I had drawn your attention in the previous slide to the fact that the branches become smaller and smaller. And then when you look at the fringe, what is happening is, is that it seems to be accumulating to some space infinite collection of points. Yeah? So if you do the subdivision infinitely often, you're going to accumulate to a dust where the, the, the dust uh, is, is where, where only place where, uh, yeah, they map, uh, formally we say that it's totally disconnected in the sense that around any point, you take a small little neighborhood, it will just look like a collection of points which are not connected to, to, to each other by any path. Yeah. So that's what the boundary of this looks like. Formally, it's what is called a canter set. What is a canter set? From 0 to 1, closed interval from 0 to 1. Take the middle one third of the interval from 1 third to 2 third and you throw it away. Then you throw away the piece between between 1 ninth and 2 ninth. And that's the that's the middle one third of the, the first one third of the interval. Similarly, you throw away the middle one third of the last one third of the interval. And then you repeat it infinitely often. What is happening is that you're throwing away smaller and smaller intervals till you're left with what is the canter dust. Uh, just a moment, there's a phone call. I'll, I'll call you back later. So, uh, um, yeah, so this, so the, the dust is, so this, this canter dust is really the accumulate, the collection of accumulation points of the, of, of this tree. What is the structure that is there? It's basically, if you look at this canter set, which I just described to you formally, namely, you throw away the middle one thirds of the unit interval and then keep repeating it infinitely often, then the same structure of the set is repeated infinitely often at all scales. So instead of taking the whole unit interval, if you just take the interval from 0 to 1 third, and you say multiply that by 3, then you're going to get back the whole set that you started off with. Namely, the whole canter set is the same, has the same structure at all scales. You divide it by 3, divide it by 9, divide by 27, 81. The structure that, that is there on that little scale is the same as the structure that is there at all scales. Yeah? So this is the self-replicating structure or uh, um, is, 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 has a name. It's called a fractal. Yeah? It's basically comes the fractal. The frac part of it comes from fraction. And it's basically something which has fractional dimension. Yeah? So, it's, so this is there are these two features that, that are really captured by a tree. Namely, that there's this hyperbolic geometry inside and on the fringe, yeah, on this, the place where the foliage was there, where the, the leaves were supposed to be attached, the geometry of that has this fractal nature. So these are the two words in the title uh, that really need to be explained. A, hyperbolic geometry, think of it as the geometry underlying a tree, and fractal is essentially the, the geometry or the structure, the analytic structure of the boundary of the fringe of this tree. Yeah. So that's what it is. So now let's get back to what uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a graph without loops. We've mentioned this before. And I said that after giving you a formal definition of a tree, which is this graph that you see in front of you, 
collection of uh, it's a yeah, graph without loops. I said that I would come back to a physical problem. And that's this question, what exactly is the tri tree trying to do and how come this geometry, this hyperbolic geometry is emerging by trying to solve a physical problem, physical or biological problem, the tree trying to do. And essentially, it's a fairly simple thing. The tree is trying to maximize the amount of food that it can manufacture for itself. For that, what does it need to do? It needs to have a surface area which can get the largest amount of sunlight. That's the physical problem or a biological problem that the tree is trying to solve. Uh, so the, the biological problem is trying to manufacture the largest amount of food, get the largest amount of sunlight for that. And in order to solve that, the, the physics or math, the, the, the problem at the interface of physics or mathematics that it's trying to solve is really it's trying to maximize its surface area of contact with the atmosphere, which is exactly what see the largest amount of sunlight. So I think a lot of you probably, I mean, you definitely know that if you want to minimize surface area, then the the given a certain amount of volume, the surface area is uh, the shape which minimizes the surface area of the given uh, fixed volume is is the round sphere. That's why, because of surface tension, uh, little droplets of water falling become round spherical. But this is the opposite problem. What is the physical system doing? Say that the tree has a fixed amount of resources available to it. So which means it has that you translate that to say that the tree has some fixed amount of volume available which it can occupy. What it does is using that fixed amount of volume maximize of what a droplet of water falling under gravity is doing. Instead of minimizing surface area, this is trying to maximize surface area. And any time you have this kind of a maximization of surface area problem, the geometry that naturally emerges is hyperbolic. So now we've given two fairly loose uh, notions of hyperbolic geometry. A, the geometry of a tree, and then the more formal structure underlying it, namely the geometry geometry that emerges any time a system tries to maximize surface area or maximize connections at the surface. All right. This particular problem of maximizing surface area is not specific to a tree. It's something that occurs in the natural world all over the place. So this is a, an example of either a sea anemone or a sponge. So essentially what is happening is that you have this so each of these things is like a disk p boundary right so the so the what's 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 this uh, c creature trying to do again it is trying to maximize its area of contact with the water so that it can capture the largest amount of food particles yeah. and therefore the geometry of the inside is like a very floppy hat in, so inverted so basically the the tip of the hat is on the floor of the ocean or the sea and the the rim of the hat is 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 in the water yeah and what it's trying to do is it's trying to maximize its area of contact with the water and the boundary the boundary is now it's it's this round loop but it goes all over the place before it closes up on itself so you can see that this the, the rim of the inverted hat is extremely wiggly. Yeah? So this again has the same pattern. It's It's got a structure which replicates itself on all scales. So this is a disk which has hyperbolic geometry built into it. And the boundary has this fractal nature, very wavy nature. And this two-dimensional disk, here you can actually start seeing negative curvature or hyperbolic geometry as was classically understood. What happens is that if you look at a path that goes from the tip of this disk to the bottom, it's going to be curved outward. But there are points here where it again curves inwards. So there are, so if you take a point on that disk, what happens is that there are two normals one pointing away outward into the water, the other pointing inward into the 
the the area which is captured by this disk so the easiest way the, the easiest way to say what this geometry is is as the seat where whether the person the jockey sits and there's the part which is which sits on the top of the horse so one is curved upward with the normal pointing towards the sky the other side the orthogonal side it's bent to fit on the on the back of the horse so it points into the body of the horse so these are two normal directions to a surface which point in exactly opposite directions the same thing happens in uh, i mean there's this uh, <coughs> standard uh, uh, stool on which which, which we use in uh, in bengal mora so there you will see that on one side there's a normal which is pointing inward and there's one pointing outwards so that that's all this kind of geometry where there are normals pointing in out in in opposite directions and in opposite directions whenever that happens that's an example what what used to be called negatively curved geometry or hyperbolic geometry so this is another example again i am stressing the fact that that there's a system which is trying to solve a maximization of surface area problem and the geometry that emerges is hyperbolic geometry and as soon as you have this maximization of surface area problem the boundary develops this fractal nature okay and uh, our how about our human system the same thing happens in our brains so what happens is that if you look at this at the cellular level the neurons are trying to multiply the connections as fast as possible and that this this trying to uh, one connect one neuron connecting to say a very large number of neurons is basically this kind of branching that goes on in a tree and what that is forcing is that the surface is becoming extremely wiggly extremely crunkulated there are these uh, sulci and gyri the, the the negative curvature can be embedded in our three dimensional euclidean space this is really the mathematical or geometric reason behind the behind the fact that we see around us all the time that trees try to shorten their branches as they go further and further away from the ground so this is the geometric reason and it's um, and i think yeah having having mentioned what these hyperbolic metric spaces are we go back to this picture and see that more oh, that limbs get smaller and smaller in order to fit in r2 again stressing the fact that the geometry of the tree and the geometry of r2 are violations of each other and this accumulates to a cantor set as i have said before that is an example of fractals so this is the second player in our game that enters namely fractals all right the third player in the game is groups of so what is a group and again from a discrete group it's a it's it's a collection of symmetries of a space so you can think of it as the collection of words generated by just say two letters a and b the only thing that extra that you need is that it a has an inverse b has an inverse yeah and yeah the, the standard uh, sort of rules that these guys follow from this you can construct a graph where the vertex vertex set of the graph consists of all the elements of the group the edge set consists of pairs of vertices that means pairs of group elements which differ by the generators yeah so here is an example this is what is called the free group on two generators so this is generated by a and b what is the group what is the collection of symmetries all finite words with the only restriction that if you have a and a inverse following each other you cancel it off yeah you remove a times a inverse is equal to identity b followed by b in inverse is identity similarly a inverse followed by a b inverse followed by b you just mentioned here this this kelly the so called kelly graph what is it it's a regular four valent tree so in a very natural way from groups which are groups of symmetries say of euclidean motion etc etc um you can extract a very geometric object namely this infinite graph and this is a so we was already mentioned that a tree is hyperbolic so the free group on two generators is an example of a group whose scaly graph is hyperbolic 
So a group we'll say is hyperbolic if some Cayley graph is generally is, is a is a hyperbolic metric space. So now we have three players in the game. There was this hyperbolic geometry we started off with, the boundary of of such a hyperbolic space which has fractal nature. Now we want the space itself to be acted upon by symmetries. And so those symmetries are given by a group. And that group, because it acts in this very nice way on a hyperbolic space, we call such a group a hyperbolic group. All right. And it's a general fact that the boundaries of these hyperbolic groups are fractals. Let's just give a few artistic examples. I mean, uh, examples of hyperbolic groups. So here is an example. So what is this given by? There are three reflections, A, B, and C. So the, the word this the word A square equal to identity means that a reflection composed with itself is the, is the identity. So A, B, and C are all three reflections. But if you compose A with B, this is this vertex where there are four, where there are um, four triangles. Yeah. So you reflect first in this black and then in this then in the white. What happens is that you are rotating through pi in the process. If you rotate through pi about a fixed vertex, then two such rotations is going to give back the identity. So that's this relation AB whole square. BC to the 4. This is the place where eight triangles attach. So the angle around every vertex is pi by 4. So if you rotate twice, once by B, once by C, you're going to rotate, rotate by pi by 4 plus pi by 4, which is pi by 2. So 4 times pi by 2 is 2 pi, and you're going to come back to the... This is the, indicated by this relation BC, that means reflection B followed by reflection C, whole to the power 4, is the identity. Similarly, CA6 means basically there are 12 triangles around the vertex, reflect by C, reflect by A, you rotate by 2 pi by 6, which is pi by 3. Uh, sorry, you rotate by pi by pi by 12, pi by 12. That's pi by 6. So if you if one rotation is pi by 6, how many times do you have to rotate? You'll have to rotate six times that. So that's that's the CA to the 6. So this is an example of a triangle whose angles are pi by 2, pi by 4, pi by 6. Note that. The sum of the angles of the triangle is not equal to pi, not equal to 180 degrees. It's actually less than 180 degrees. So it's 90 degrees, 45 degrees, and 30 degrees. That's strictly less than 180 degrees. So triangle, this was the way hyperbolic geometry was initially discovered in the mathematical world. How to form a system of geometry of the angles of the triangle is, is less than less than two right angles. Yeah. <coughs> and this tiling of this <coughs> round disc, which is tiled by these triangles, which are becoming smaller and smaller, accumulating towards the boundary circle, is again another standard example of hyperbolic geometry. So think this, think of this triangle, this this tiling of this disc as a placeholder for your tree, and the boundary circle as a as as a placeholder for the foliage for the boundary of the tree. So this is again another example, a more formal mathematical example of hyperbolic geometry and the boundary being a circle or boundary being a fractal circle. Uh, recall that picture that we had shown about the sea anemone sponge where the interior has uh, negative curvature but the boundary is fractal. But this particular picture was converted into a painting by Maurice Escher. So some of you must have seen this painting before. This is again a tiling where there are these fish where, where, whose heads are pointing towards each other. And then as you go further and further away from the center, the fish become smaller and smaller. And then they start accumulating. And you can start seeing the dust, right? Because there are so many colors around the circle. So there is this fractal nature of the boundary starts getting visible once you start putting these colors in. So there's a painting by Maurice Escher to show that this hyperbolic geometry in the interior accumulates to a fractal on the boundary. All right. So I think uh, we have uh, said the, the, the general introduction. So now I'll go to in the last 10 minutes or so. Uh, how, how much time do I have? You can take as long as you need. 
We are here. No. Okay. So fine. Let, let, I, I think I'll try to finish up in 10 minutes. So now we'll come to finally to uh, the, the, in the last 10 minutes. We'll try to talk about a more uh, uh, something that came from uh, some research problem. And this, this part of it is, is more sort of mathematical. And so I've kept only for the last bit of the talk. So what about the relative problem? So suppose you have, again, these three structures which interact very nicely with each other. What was it? There's this group of symmetries, which you extract. A group of symmetries is an algebraic structure. From that, you extract a geometric object, namely this hyperbolic group. And on the boundary, you have a more analytical structure, namely the fractal. So here, what is happening is that you have a hyperbolic. What if you have substructures? What about substructures? That's really the relative question. Yeah? So you have a particular kind of structure. And the question that you're asking is, what about structures inside this, which show up, which, which reflect the same structure as the, that of the ambient space? So essentially, what the, the setup, therefore, is that you have a subgroup H of a group G. So all the structures are respected. H is hyperbolic, G is hyperbolic. H is a group, G is a group. And the question that you're asking, so this naturally gives rise to the inclusion of the geometry. H includes into the paleograph of G. And what the question that you're asking is, is there a continue, is the, is the fractal nature also replicated at the boundary? So is there a continuous, there's the fractal, the first fractal, does it map naturally onto the second fractal? So the, 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 the least that you can, that one would be happy with would be a continuous map where, where it doesn't get torn. Yeah. So basically, if you try to um, map something continuously to another, it means that you can continuously deform one and map it to the other. So if think, think of an elastic string and then you deform the elastic string, put it, paste it together at some places and then put it on some uh, image object. Yeah. All that you are, you are, what you're not allowed to do is tear. Yeah. Tearing is a discontinuous operation. Okay. And what you're asking here is, is the relative structure of the fractal also respected? And in this generality, the answer is no. However, and this is the, the main uh, theorem, which is, uh, which we want to finish this talk with. And an analogous, but much more classical problem comes when you have a hyperbolic group acting by symmetries on what is called three-dimensional hyperbolic space. So we live in three-dimensional Euclidean space. So what is three-dimensional hyperbolic space? How do we measure distances in Euclidean space? This is something that we've all seen in class 11, 12. You look at ds squared equal to dx squared plus dy squared plus dz squared. This is dimensional Pythagoras theorem. But in hyperbolic three space, you have this extra extra factor of z square and you don't look at the entire euclidean space you look at only the upper half space so z goes off z is positive so what is so this is our standard model for three dimensional hyperbolic geometry its boundary the base of that is the complex plane and there's one point at infinity so the the complex plane with a single point at infinity, you put these two things together, what you get is the Riemann sphere. Yeah, it's, this is called the Riemann sphere. So have a plane and you have one point at infinity and you pull the whole plane together at that point, the sphere. So the boundary at infinity is the sphere and the space itself is hyperbolic free space. Yeah. And so these groups, now we'll introduce the groups into the picture. So what exactly is a group? Is It's a collection of symmetries of hyperbolic three space. Yeah. And what, how are you going to come, uh, throw away all the extra, um, say, the, the spurious symmetry? What you do is basically quotient out the space. So what does quotienting out mean? This is a geometric construction. So I'll illustrate by this picture. So just think of the two-dimensional plane. Yeah, the flat plane is, is there in front of you. And then you look at these two elements, 0, 0 goes to 1, 0. So it's translation by, to the right, by one unit. Similarly, the, 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 these are given by these blue arrows. The red arrow gives you a way of translating vertically 
by you by unit distance so what is the collection of of charge which have no distinct representatives essentially that's that's given by this tile here so you look at this square tile yeah from 0 0 to 0 1 to 1 1 to 1 0 that's the square tile yeah and what is happening is that the bottom blue arrow gets identified with the top blue arrow similarly the left red arrow and the right red arrow get identified so if you get so basically if you translate the red arrow by one unit you just go to the next red arrow so this quotienting operation in, in geometry basically means you identify the, the left vertical with the right vertical and what you get is this bicycle tube. Yeah. So this is an example of what is called formally in mathematics we call it a torus. But what it is is really this R2 act, acted upon by Z plus Z and the quotient space is this torus. At a single line, yeah, just the blue line and this Z acting on the real line by translation by integers. When you quotient out, you're just going to get a single circle. So that is what the quotient operation is about. And so uh, this is another example, but this is an example of something more hyperbolic. So if you remember this Escher's paintings that we had drawn, what we had done there was we tiled the hyperbolic plane by some symmetric guy. Here it's an octagon. This is an example of what is what is a, what is a hyperbolic octagon. Yeah? One, two, three. Four, five, six, seven, eight. Eight sides, yeah? And when you quotient and you identify, you get something that is a little more weird. It's not a single torus. You're going to get two tori, and then they are uh, glued along, along a common waste, yeah? So this is another more interesting thing. This is what, so this is essentially the geometric quotienting operation that we're talking about. So now let's return to the three-dimensional problem with this notion of quotienting under our belt. Groups of symmetries of the boundary of the hyperbolic space, namely the Riemann sphere. This has a nice description. Essentially, it is all two cross two matrices with complex entries and determinant one. This matrix group turns out to have a geometric representation. It's it's the group of the hyperbolic three space. Now suppose this collection of groups is acting nicely, which means it's 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 um, it's acting discreetly, just as we had z plus z acting on the plane. So we can pass to a quotient, and the the, the quotient of this guy is the, uh, the this group actually the group that we started off with. It it uh, appears again in the quotient and you can recover the group. You forget, don't, you don't need to know what this fundamental group means, the word fundamental group means. It's just that the group of symmetries can be recovered from the, from the quotient space itself. So that's this three-dimensional manifold. So here is the geometric candidate in our picture. Yeah? This is what was the tree in, in, in the pictures that we have shown. So this is our three-dimensional gadget three-dimensional gadget, which is a quotient of hyperbolic three space, mod the group. And the boundary of hyperbolic three space is the sphere. On that, again, so this group acts by geometric transformations, isometries of the hyperbolic three space. It acts by Mobius. What are Mobius transformations? These are the standard uh, transformations that we learn in complex analysis. Z goes to AZ plus B by CZ plus D. A, B, C, D complex numbers. Again, AD minus BC equal to 1. So the same group, 2 cross 2 matrices with determinant 1, it has two incarnations. A, it acts as acts geometrically on three-dimensional space. B, it acts conformally of preserving the complex analytic structure or preserving angles on the Riemann sphere, on the boundary at infinity. Okay. So, um, so there's two things. Again, let, let me before before we come to the final slide. Let me just stress this because this is this is probably a little technical. So there are two things here. One is there's dynamics on the boundary. So basically what is happening is that you take a point and then you act on it by this group. So it's, it's some compact amount of space available. This is this is the unit sphere. These are taking that point all over the place, but there are infinitely many of them. Yeah. This, this group is going to act in some way by mixing up various pieces of the sphere. So that's called the dynamics on the sphere. In the interior, the action is much nicer. 
it acts by preserving a fundamental domain and translating it all over the place. And that part is discrete. So there's a geometric component coming from high quality geometry. There's a complex analytic component com coming from the action on the boundary sphere. And the main theorem that we wanted to say, I'm not stating it in full technicality because that's not, not relevant today. Thing is that there is an exact dictionary between the dynamics, dynamic picture of the G action of a group action on the Riemann sphere. This is where the fractal part of it comes through. If you remember, there was this picture which I had glossed over from, uh, there was this uh, dimensional space picture with a blue background, and there was a very ornamental fractal there. That thing is this fractal sitting inside Riemann sphere C hat, and there's a group action on it, which is, which is, uh, which, which uh, um, encodes fractal dynamics. And the space, you have the three-dimensional gadget. So it's a two-dimensional thing and two-dimensional dynamics. That's the boundary of the, of the hyperbolic three space. And you have this three-dimensional geometry of the hyperbolic space that you can pass to the quotient and you have the geometry of the quotient. So this is the hyperbolic geometry. And the theorem basically says that from two, you can recover one directly. And from one, you can recover two completely. So these two pieces, in some sense, the entire geometric uh, information in the interior is captured entirely by dynamics on the boundary. Yeah. And these two things are the are equivalent pieces of information. And I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much for your lucid and fascinating presentation and giving us the exquisite beauty that is evident to manifestation. I mean, many of us are probably not going to look at a tree the same as we were doing this morning. We'll see a new a tree in a new light. So under normal circumstances, those in the audience may have had the privilege of asking you a few questions, but unfortunately that is not possible today. But I sincerely hope that in the near future, you will kindly consent once again to come to Bose Institute and give us the pleasure of hosting you in person. We eagerly look forward to this day. Thank you. Thank you once again from all of us here at Bose Institute. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, with this, we have come to the end of today's session. I thank you all for joining us. Hope you and your family remain safe and healthy. Goodbye from the Bose Institute.